Are we up and running? Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for coming tonight. Uh, I'm Kate Cook. I'm a city councilor here in Portsmouth, and I'm also a member of the Portsmouth Energy Advisory Committee. Um, I am very, very fortunate to serve on that committee with people with vast expertise on power issues related to New Hampshire and um, where we should be going with power. Um, Councillor John Tabor is the chair of that committee, and it's really an honor to serve with him as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Portsmouth is an eco municipality, and it's it's been a priority for us for years to think think about sustainability in the city of Portsmouth. Um, in 2018, we adopted a renewable energy policy for the city, and our goal was to get to net zero. Part of that goal is to take steps to find ways to help people reduce their dependence on fossil fuels and help the city to do that as well. So in doing that, we've talked um, most recently and joined on February 22nd, we signed our joint powers agreement to be a part of the Community Power Coalition of New Hampshire. Our goals in doing so were to make sure we have competitive rates and expanded choices for residents in Portsmouth, um, also to have greener, more resilient power for the region, to have a strong partnership with Eversource. And I think that that's really an important piece here. And you see that, you will see that tonight because you have representatives here um, who are providing this wonderful presentation to you tonight. Um, and also one of our goals was to make sure that we have a good regional cooperation and collaboration to help um, decrease costs for energy in New Hampshire and to help, help our residents understand ways to help reduce their individual costs. Uh, with that said, I'm very fortunate tonight to introduce you to Tom Fowle, who is from the Rye Energy Committee, and he's going to come up here and say a few more things about community power. Uh, I'm Tom Fowle, I'm the co-chair of the Rye Energy Committee. And uh, we've been working for the last uh, year or so on uh, enrolling in community power and getting it to roll out. There's a, a, a handout on the table back there. I hope you'll take with you. Is anybody here from Rye? No, okay. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, well, uh, basically community power allows a town or mis municipality or a county to aggregate all their power usage together and go out to market to buy power at a hopefully lower rate. And it also gives the town uh, more control over where they get their power. So the idea of community power is that it will become the default electric supplier for one of its participants. So we're hoping that in April or May of next year that we'll roll out dry community power and we'll start to receive our power through the coalition of Community Power of New Hampshire. So uh, this uh, little handout here will tell you more about that. But the idea is that um, it will only roll out if the price that they can offer is lower than the default price that Eversource is offering at the time. So uh, that's something to look forward to. And I think the other thing to look forward to is that the rates we hope will be more stable that um, they will not go from six cents two years ago to 22 cents today, but um, maybe stay somewhere in between and do a little more so you can plan a little better for your budgets. So that's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Ted Stiles, who's gonna give us a presentation from New Hampshire Saves about um, how to save energy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, I'm a support to the community. You never know how many people are going to come to these events. I've done these for two people, and I've done them for 50 people before. You really just never know. Uh, I think there's another meeting going, uh, meeting going on across town that may have taken some people, but I'm sure you guys will all take something from this, and you're going to tell your friends and neighbors too. And there are a bunch of people attending by Zoom, so no worries on that front. Um, again, my name's Ted. Uh, I'm going to be doing this presentation tonight. Hopefully, you're here to, to learn about improving the energy efficiency of your home. If you're here to learn computers or Spanish or something like that, those are in other rooms in the library, so make sure you're in the right place. Uh, if you want to slip out at some point because you're in the wrong place, uh, go ahead and do that. Um, let's see. Uh, yeah, we're, this program is um, going 
going on throughout the whole entire state in different towns. Uh, there's a few more coming up. I was in Monroe, way up north last night, and did one in Monroe. Um, it's sponsored by all the different utilities that you see there. And um, without further ado, let's get going. Um, I talk really fast. Uh, uh, I'm pretty passionate about this stuff. We got a lot of material to cover. If you want to ask questions, um, you know, while we're going, that's fine. But um, we're probably going to cover whatever it is you're going to ask. And of course, we haven't even gotten past the first slide, and we've hit our first snag because I can't advance the slide. Where that is. Hmm. Well, that's never happened before. <laughs> Do we have a tech person that can help? Stop sharing, start again. Okay, let's try that. Share screen. Uh, maybe it's this one instead. Maybe I shared the wrong one. Hmm. Congrats. Oh, there we go. I think we're good. Am I still sharing my screen though? No. Okay, so let's try that again. Right here, upper right corner. Oh, well, that's a new place for it. I've never seen it there before. I'll try that. <laughs> okay, so I'll do that. Anything? Okay. There's the zoom window. Press your screen. So I got two up here, but I think this is the one I want. Here, share screen. It's what? Slideshow from the current slide. How's that? All right. Well, let's see if we can advance. There we go. All right. So here's the overview of what we're going to cover tonight. Um, Again, yeah, I'll be around at the end. If there's something that you want to ask that we didn't cover, um, we can hang out till they kick us out. Uh, but this is what we're going to cover. I usually start off by asking people, what do you think the greatest energy is? And what are some of the typical answers you think I get? Well, let's try it. Let me ask. What are Solar, that's usually one of the first ones. What are some other ones? Wind usually comes up as a good one. Any other ones? What is it? Water. Water, hydro, yeah, that one usually comes up too. And then I say, you're all wrong. <laughs> um, don't, don't get me wrong, I love solar power. I wish I could afford it on my house. Hopefully someday soon I will. Um, I think some of those things are great. I'm a big fan of wind power, but power production has an environmental cost to it, right? There's always a downside or environmental cost of producing power. We have to produce power, but there's a cost to that. So really, to me, the greenest energy is the green energy you're not using at all. The energy you're using by using less energy. There's not really much of an argument you can make against using less energy. There's absolutely no environmental cost in using less energy. So I was a school teacher for about 20 years. And when I was getting a little burned out, I was looking for something different. I wanted to get into the renewable energy, energy efficiency, conservation field in some way, shape, or form. And I didn't quite know where I was going to fit in. And I actually saw this on a bumper sticker. You know, green energy is the energy you're not using. I was like, oh, that's so true. That's where I want to be. That's why I want to become an energy auditor. I want to help people produce their energy because, I, well, I think it's great that, that people are putting solar on and that you're doing wind farms and things. Really, the first step is to reduce your energy demand or um, so you don't have to use as much energy. So it's kind of just a little bit of background on, you know, on me. The other reason that I think it's important is because in New Hampshire here, we spend a lot of money on energy. Um, is there, there isn't anyone here that just moved here, right? Where everyone's from New Hampshire. Like I have, I had a customer recently from South Carolina. And they lived in a brand new house in South Carolina and they moved up here and bought like a house from the 1880s. That has an oil steam heat system in the basement. And the guy was like, oil? Who uses oil to heat? That's crazy. And I said, that's the most popular fuel in New Hampshire. Like, I know they don't tell you that when they try to get you to move to New Hampshire in the little brochure that they sent out, but 
Most of us are using oil or propane because we don't have cheap electricity. We don't have cheap natural gas. Um, so our energy bills are really big. Um, he also was completely shocked when I told him he's going to be heating his house for six months. He said, six months? He's like, that's crazy. Man. Almost to six to eight, you know? I think he might actually move south, back to South Carolina because, um, you know, and he's in this old house that, that was, you know, absolutely horrible and everything. So anyway, so we spent a lot of money on energy. This is just kind of a general graph of how the average family spends their energy dollars in a home. Of course, it obviously varies from house to house. Depends on how many kids you have, et cetera, et cetera. But you can see the biggest chunk of the pie is the red there. That's the space heating, keeping your house warm and cool. So, you know, I'm glad that there's people out there who don't remember better refrigerators. But, well, first of all, I'm not an engineer, so I couldn't go into that field even if I wanted to. But they're only like sort of getting that little piece. Uh, no matter how many how refri you know how many efficient refrigerators we get out there, it's still only a small piece of the pie. So if you really want to have a big impact on energy reduction, in my mind, this is where you need to put your efforts. So that's why I'm really happy that you know during the day I'm an energy auditor, and then at night I put on my my Batman uniform or whatever, and this is what I did. Um, one of the first things you can do is um, you know besides just grumble and write the check out when you get your electric bill. Um, is to take some time and look at it a little bit deeper because there's more information in there besides how much do you owe us. Um, you can look and there'll be a little graph that'll show you once a month how you're doing. Um, it'll compare you to your neighbors, which is sometimes a little controversial because sometimes that makes people feel really good about themselves when they really don't deserve to, or vice versa, it can make them feel really bad when they don't really deserve to feel bad because they got a bunch of kids. And so I, I don't know exactly how they do some of these comparisons because they don't necessarily know the, you know, how many people are in each house that they're comparing and everything. So a little bit of a, some weirdness in there, but anyway, there's more information in there besides that. This is just kind of a, you know, a, again, a general sense of, of how people use their, you know, their power. 600 kilowatts, of, you know, kilowatt hours a month or about 7,200 uh, annually is, again, the average. That could be, you know, a lot different based on your, your house. In terms of things that are in your house that are using the most power, um, this is kind of a list that, generally speaking, goes from highest to lowest, but not exactly. Um, you can see that the top couple up there are lighting, water heating, and refrigeration and freezers. And uh, those are the, the sort of the three biggest ones. And they also, you can see they have three stars over there because those are the things that you can actually really do something about. Um, the advancements in cooking technology, those things kind of do a lot with that. So you really can't do a whole lot about improving the efficiency of your cooking. Um, even if you've got a really good clothes washer and dryer, um, first of all, you only use that a couple of times a week, refrigerator for a long time. So that's why that's you know, a little bit higher up on that list of priorities. If you're interested in delving a little bit more into how your household is using electricity, you can check one of these things out at the library. Um, it's called a kilowatt meter. And you can take anything in your house and you plug it in and you can do a little math and you can figure out like, okay, this lamp cost me, you know, $6 a year. Or this TV cost me $52 a year or something like that. Um, it takes a little bit of math, but it can be done. And it, it only works for, um, you know, plug-in devices. If you want to go a little bit deeper, you can get one of these uh, whole house electric monitors. These are really, really nifty, I think. This screenshot over here on the right is from this one called Sense. This is the one I'm most familiar with. There are some other brands that I'm not as familiar with. They're about, uh, the sense I think is about 200, 250 bucks. Um, if you have solar on your house, you can actually get one that actually will work with your solar system too and give you information and feedback about that. But what it does is it measures all the electricity in the house and it's able to pick out all the different things like the vacuum cleaner and it can differentiate that from the, um, the toaster and the garage door opener and the microwave and the lights, and the water heater. So I was at a conference one day and you know, and the, and the other guy pulled his phone out. He's like, oh look, my kid just took a really long shower because I see the electric water heater has been on for 45 minutes now. Oh, we're going to dry and just let the solar. Oh, he left a bunch of lights on. Like you can see this stuff in real time. Um, and this could be really handy too if you have some kind of weird electrical um, issue that you can't figure out um, because some things are you know, hardwired, like well pumps and things like that, or your sub pump, or um, some of the other things in your house. So this will actually help sort of figure out some of those things. Um, it says electric, electrician install here. I think that's a little bit of an extreme, uh, that's a little bit of overstating. Technically, you don't need to be an electrician to put these in. Um, they're designed for homeowners to do themselves. You want to be pretty comfortable with electricity, though, because you do have to take the color off your, your, um, 
your electric box and you got to put a clamp around there and stuff. Um, I'm actually sort of encouraging some of the energy committees to pick up one of these. And then you could um, put it in someone's house in your town for a month or two, and then you could move it to the next person's house. And in a year, you could, you know, you could go through 10 different people's houses and they could all have an experience with this for a month or two. Um, so anyway, that's um, another way you can investigate your electric usage a little bit further. It seems really fascinating, right, to put on here. Like, shut things off when you're not using them. They all know that, duh, but you'd be surprised. You know, I'm, I'm being paid during the day to go to someone's house and do an energy audit. So these are people who are really trying to save on their energy bills. And sometimes I'll walk around the house and I'll go into a room and there's a TV on. There's no one in there. And then I go in another room and there's a stereo on and there's no one in there. And then the other room's got all the lights on. There's no one in there. You know, and the homeowner's home alone and they're in the backyard mowing their lawn. But you know, there's all these things on in their house. And these are people who are, you know, paying money to get an audit to learn how to save energy. So a lot of times I think we've gotten ourselves into some bad habits. So behavioral change can go a long way too towards, you know, lowering some of your, your electric bills. Um, I don't know about you, but when you hit off on something and you leave, it's not using any more power, but there are some things in your house that are still using power, even though the button might say off, not on. We call these energy drips or vampire loads or phantom loads. There's a few different names floating out there. Um, and there's more and more of these in, in a lot of people's houses these days. I think when I was a kid, there probably weren't any, but now there's a lot. Um, these would be things with um, plug-in chargers, anything that's got a clock in there, anything with a remote control, um, lights, DVRs, things like that. Uh, you know, when I, I, most people in here probably remember um, when you were younger and you wanted to like watch a TV show, you would turn the TV on and then you could go in the, you could go to the bathroom, you could go into, you could go to the kitchen and get your milk and your cookies. And then you come back to the TV and it's warmed up ready for you. Well, since then, Americans don't want to like do that. They don't want to wait for the TV to warm up. So there's actually like a resistor in there that's using power all the time, just waiting for the homeowner to come home and sit down in his easy chair and then hit the button to turn it on and it comes on instantaneously. So that's kind of a price we've paid like as a society to have that convenience. Um, some of these things are using um, power even when they're not on. Here's a couple of examples that I pulled off the internet. Um, this is an interesting one here, the Apple TV, the first generation of that. If you had one of those, it was using 21 watts when you were using it and watching it. And when you hit the off button, like me, you probably would have thought, oh, it's going down to zero. Well, guess what? It only went down to 17 watts. <laughs> it barely dropped at all. It's using almost as much power when it's off as when it's on. Um, a couple other examples in there too, you know, even a washing machine, things like that. So the way to kind of control this situation in your house is to get yourself one of these, um, you know, power strips, smart power strips. You can get these from the Nature Shades catalog. You can get them from other places too. But if you plug things into this thing and then you hit it off, then you're actually going to be cutting off the power to that thing fully and completely. And it won't be sort of doing that vampire load thing where it's, it's still taking on power. I have one that has a remote control on it. So I have my whole entertainment system, the TV and all that kind of stuff plugged into it. Um, I think I figured mine out using a kilowatt meter. It uses like 80 or 90 watts when it's on. And when it's off, it's still using like 40 or 50 watts. So I have it on a power strip and then it's got a remote control. And as I'm going upstairs before bed, I just hit the little button, shuts everything off for the night. Um, let's see, some other easy things you can do, you can turn down your water. A lot of people have water coming out of their tap that is dangerously hot and it's a complete waste of energy. So it really only needs to be 120. Um, anybody, does anyone um, figure out why this picture, this, there's a problem with that picture, it's an error, it's, it's a mistake. It's kind of should be replaced with another picture. Anyone see why? Why it doesn't belong here? Yeah, put on your thinking cap a little bit. Frank knows. Frank is from Eversource, by the way. I forgot to introduce him in the back corner. He knows, but he can't. He doesn't count, so he can't answer. Anybody figure that out? That's not going to save any electricity turning that down. Why not? Has to, has to do with this thing, right? <clears throat> Going into it. That's a gas line, though. So this is a gas water here. So. Technically, it's not going to save any electricity to turn that down. It's going to save on gas because it's a gas water heater. If you have an electric water heater, you should turn that one down too. That'll save you electricity. Uh, yeah, minor thing. But um, yeah, humidifiers, we're not, or dehumidifiers, if you have one, you probably need it. We're not going to tell you to shut that thing off because you don't want you know, 
to have problems. Um, but make sure you're using that appropriately. Um, this shirt, I was thinking about it last night. It's one of my favorite shirts. I've had for a couple of years. It's never seen hot water or warm water in the wash ever in its life, and it's still pretty clean. Every once in a while, I'll get something really dirty and I'll use warm water or hot water in my washing machine. But really, for most things, you don't need hot water. And of course, in New Hampshire, we are, we are still able to legally use the uh, solar closed dryer or a clothesline. There are some condos and stuff where I've heard that they've passed little rules to say you can't put out a clothesline, but I think that uh, you, as long as you don't have that kind of issue, you know, go ahead. You can save a lot of energy that way too. Or in your basement. Yes, you could do that too. You got to be a little careful about getting too much humidity down there. I'm worried about that sometimes when people do that. But if you can do it and not have a problem, sure. Yeah, why not? Um, LED lights, I can't say enough good things about these. When I first started, we were showing the old mercury swirly CFL bulbs. You know, they, they take forever to warm up, they have mercury in them, they flicker, they say they work with dinners, but they don't. Um, I'm so glad we're, we're beyond that now. Now, the LED industry has really figured out all the problems with the CFLs and they figured them all out. So they're, they're cheap, they don't flicker, they work with dimmers, um, they've, they've really solved all the problems. So sometimes I'll be in someone's house and I'll be, I'll be um, replacing like say 10 bulbs in their kitchen and putting in LEDs. Well, all, all the new LEDs, if you add up the electric usage for all the 10 LEDs, Sometimes that doesn't even equal what one of the old bulbs was using that I pulled out. Um, so some of these LEDs only use, you know, six, seven, eight watts of power and they're replacing something that was using 75 or 100 watts of power. Uh, the only thing I would caution you against is to make sure you pay attention to the package. Um, most people go into the store and they see the ones that say daylight. Like, oh, I love daylight. How can you argue against daylight? And they buy the ones that say daylight and they come home and plug them in. And, ah, it's terrible. It looks like this. It's kind of like that, that bluish hue to it. Um, some people actually like that. Very, very few people. Most people like this hue. This more looks like a candle or an incandescent bulb. Um, and those ones, they call them soft white or warm white. If you want to get technical and scientific, you can actually look at the, what the rating is, the Kelvin rating, 2,700 Kelvin or, or maybe even up to 3,000. That's going to give you this sort of warm, more yellowish look that most people prefer. But uh, stay away from the ones that say daylight, even though it sounds nice. You know, daylight is nice out when it's outside, but when it's in your house for some reason, it doesn't do the same thing. Um, some other real, you know, you know low hanging fruit, easy things you can do, low flow shower heads. Sometimes people are afraid of those. I think it's just gonna be a little bit of a drip, dribble, 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 but most of my customers say they feel like there's more water coming out of these things than there was before because it's coming out at a you know, higher, higher pressure. Um, this pipe wrap is really, really effective and it's really easy to put off. Like a 10 year old could do it. Um, you, need, you have to use some scissors, but so watch your 10 year old that you're going to have a 10 year old doing it with you. But um, really easy to do that. Um, we're not going to tell you to go out and you know ditch all your appliances and get all Energy Star appliances right now because that would be a horrible thing for the planet if we all did that. But when your appliances do need to be replaced, that's when it's time to start looking for that label because that's going to save energy in the long run. The other good thing about the Energy Star label is you can get a really good rebate for a lot of different things. Even like a broom purifier, you can get a, a rebate for that now, or your pool pump. Um, so these are mostly mail in rebates, things like that. The refrigerator um, program is really popular. You can go to some of these, um, these uh, websites here and get more information about these. The main reason we're here is because of this guy. Right. This hopefully is not what you look like in your house, although I have been in homes where people look like this sometimes because they're keeping the heat down so low because they can't afford to keep the heat up because the house is so uninsulated. So hopefully this is you just walking around outside in the winter. Um, so, you know, when, when people when I go to someone's house and they, and you know, they want to spend less money on energy, I could just tell them what to turn the thermostat down, you know, get some better long underwear and a thicker hat and some thicker you know, socks and you'll be fine. You'll save energy. You'll save money, but that's not acceptable, right? Because we want to be warm in our house and we want to save energy. So that's kind of where the challenge comes in. A couple of things you can do again, low hanging fruit we're starting with here is just to make sure that you're turning you know off the heat in a room if you're or in the house if you're not going to be in there for all day for work or at night when you're sleeping. If you're just going out for a half hour, it's really not going to do anything to turn the heat down. Okay. But if you're going out for a long stretch of time, 
turn the heat down. Now, yes, your your boiling your furnace is going to have a triangle that you can hold and turn the heat back up, but um, that energy that it uses to do that is actually less energy than it would have taken just to keep that house or that room warm all day. Um, so sometimes people like don't quite believe that, but technically speaking, if you if you look at the physics of it, it actually is true. Um, Programmable thermostats. I mean, who can argue with that? You go to work, you forget to turn the heat down. Well, the programmable thermostat will do it for you. You get in bed, you pull the cart, you know, all the cushions up, all, all the comforters up, and you're laying there, and you forgot to turn the heat down. Programmable thermostat will do it for you. You don't have to get out of bed to do that. Um, honestly, I'm not personally a huge fan of some of these new, like, Wi-Fi enabled ones and everything. Um, they're pretty expensive. If, if that's your thing, then that's fine. But, you know, the, the, the basic thermostat, programmable thermostat that's very inexpensive, will do most of the same things that those do um, for most people. Um, hopefully everyone has their ACs out already, right? It's winter product, your AC should not be, I don't think, well, actually they say this weekend, it's supposed to be really warm, but not warm enough to run an AC probably, but yeah, those things are not supposed to be in a winter. Um, and, and it's not on here, but you, the, other, the, the other thing is to think about is your storm windows. If you have storm windows, those, you know, you have them open in the, in the summer maybe, but now it's time to close those. You know, pay good money for those, close them up. Um, windows, windows are designed to be latched shut. The, the weather stripping around the edges is really only gonna work the way it's supposed to work if, if it's actually clamped shut. So make sure you, you kind of run through all those things before winter comes. So a little bit of you know, basic building science and going back to some physics that you might remember from you know, your days maybe in high school or in college, but you know, some of the basic uh, principles that you kind of need to know to get a grasp on this stuff. First thing is that heat always goes from hot to cold and it always is happening. We can't stop it. If anyone tells you they can stop it, just kick them out because it's not true. We slow it down. We can slow it down a lot, but we can't stop it. When heat moves, you may have heard these terms, conduction, convection, radiation. We're really not gonna talk about radiation much tonight because if we were in like Phoenix or, or in Florida, maybe we might be talking about that. But in, in our climate, most buildings are losing heat through convection and conduction. So those are the two we're gonna kind of do a quick review of and then talk about how those affect your houses. So as I said, you know, heat always goes to cold and heat does travel through solid objects. So like this person up here has a, I, I'm guessing that's a metal poker or something in a fire. Well, they don't have a glove on, so pretty soon their, their hand's gonna get burned. They're gonna let go of that because the heat will go right through that solid object. There's two bricks, right? Um, the hot one's on the bottom, the cold one's on the top. But the heat's gonna go up to the cold. It doesn't matter if the bricks are side by side, left to right, top to bottom, it doesn't matter. The heat is always gonna go from the hotter one into the colder one. Um, so what do we do about that? We use insulation because insulation is actually a bad thermal conductor. It does not allow heat to go through as quickly as you might otherwise. So that's a good thing, right? In, in your house, you want to have things that are, are bad thermal conductors, which is, you know, equal to good insulation. A lot of things, you know, everything has an R value to it, right? Um, this is this is actually CV up here. This is taken out of the house in Walpole, New Hampshire. Um, about a year ago, I took that. There was a company that used to put seaweed in people's houses. Um, this is actually like pantyhose and underwear and stuff. And you know you're desperate when you're putting your underwear in, the, in your walls. Um, this is what we used to be like a, a fully insulated house back in the 50s. It would be an inch or two of that stuff. Um, you know, that, that's sort of laughable today that that would actually be adequate, but um, bedding, right? I just took this picture on the top left just last week. Somebody, the previous, the homeowner had no idea that was even up there, but I was like, yeah, we should get rid of this stuff. It's all this comforters and bedding and these lounge cushions and stuff. I'm like, yeah, that stuff is not designed to be insulation. It might have an R value, but it's not designed to be insulation. So let's get rid of that. Corn cobs, you see that in a lot of older houses. Hard to tell if that's like, if the rats brought that up there enough to do, or maybe it was a farmer who had all this leftover stuff. And he's like, hey, I don't know what the R value of this stuff is, but it's gotta help. So you dump it all up in your attic. In terms of modern materials that we use in houses, right? these are some of the different things that you might either have in your house now or want to put in your house, and everything has a different R value. So the first thing you're probably used to, you know, people have a glass like this, right? like fluffy fiberglass, that's about three and a half per inch. Um, cellulose is another product that often uses basically that, it's like a, a meat things like that. Um, 
That's about the same R value as that. Rigid foam board like this is now, is now getting into a higher range. It's more like four. That's about R6 per inch. So this is too much thick, so it'll be about R12. Um, spray foam. This would be, you know, this would actually be sprayed onto a wall, it sticks to the wall. This is just a piece of it, right? So that's also has a really high R value. So that doesn't automatically mean that this is what you want in your house, just because it has a high R value. But this is also pretty expensive, and there's different properties of these things. So in some places in your house, Depending on your house, this might be the way to go, but in other places, it might be way more cost effective and appropriate to use something on site. Um, you can see here, you know, wood is not very insulated. It has an R value of about one for, for every inch. Um, concrete is terrible. It doesn't matter how thick it is. If you could have a, a four inch thick wall or an eight or 12 inch thick wall, it's still only about R1 in your basement. That's usually where you see concrete walls. The, uh, the thing to remember about this stuff too is that it's not, it might say R value on the material, but it depends on how well it's put in. It's like a lot of things in life, right? Like it's not, not just the material, but how well it was put in. And in a lot of cases, the installation is really, really poor because either a homeowner did it, didn't know what they were doing, or I hate to say, a contractor maybe did it and they don't know what they're doing. Because in New Hampshire, like, are there any hair cutters in here? No. If I if I wanted to become a hair cutter, I, I'm pretty sure in New Hampshire you have to get a license from the state to be, to cut hair. But to blow insulation, you don't have to get any kind of state. Well, it's sort of like the Wild West, so the install quality can vary quite a bit. Um, the energy codes we are now you know up to following the 2015 building code, so we're only. Uh, what are seven years behind now? Um, up until recently, we were following the 2009 building code. So we're getting there, we're, we're moving up. Um, most houses in New Hampshire are not even close to the R values that are prescribed in the building code. Um, and the building code is, in my experience, the building code is what it is on paper, but in real life, it's not always being uh, enforced in every single town. Because some towns don't have building inspectors. Sometimes I have building inspectors that don't know or don't care or don't have time to do it. So um, I have customers that move here from other states and they're just appalled by what's in their attic and what's in their walls and then what's in their basement. And they're like, geez, what, like, what's going on here? I'm like, oh, you're in New Hampshire now. Like, it's not Massachusetts. It's not New Jersey. I'm from New Jersey, so I can say that. Um, this is an interesting little quiz down here or a demonstration that I've put together. This is kind of, it's hard to see maybe or visualize, but this is like an aerial picture of someone's attic. You can see the floor joists. The white stuff is supposed to represent all the insulation that's up there. And the, the dark areas are the gaps or the holes. I kind of wish it would be reversed so that the dark areas were the insulation. But um, you can see that, you know, whoever did this did a pretty good job, right? It's mostly white. They got 95% of it. So the question is, okay, they put R38 insulation in this attic, 95% of it. But those parts that have all those little gaps and holes, what's that doing to the overall R value of that attic? Like what, what's the R value of the whole entire attic? Anyone want to take a guess what it might be? What's, what's that? Well, it's going to be less than R30. So this is R38. Because of all the gaps, remember high insulation, a higher value is good. Lower, lower value is not so good. So it's going to drop from R38 because of all these gaps down to something less than 30. It actually drops down to like below R20. It's actually more like R13. So even though it's just a little bit, you know, just a little bit of gray areas there, because the heat loss through those gray areas is so quick and so tremendous that it sort of negates the effectiveness of all this other stuff. Sometimes people think that you know it's just a little bit of area in their attic. You know, it's how how much of an effect could that have? Well, it, you know, it can have a really big effect. A couple different ways insulation can be uh, can be done wrong. It could be insufficient, which is just not enough insulation. So here you can actually see like bare sheetrock, right? So that's not insulation. There's a couple of layers of soil is here. Um, but you know, these like you shouldn't see those in your attic. Those should be favoring insulation. So the fact that you can see those tells you there's not enough insulation. The middle picture shows there was some insulation down in between the, 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 the members of wood that are here going across, and then someone laid fiberglass down, but there's all these cracks in there. The cracks are so big you can actually see the wood sticking out there. So that's 
sort of what we call an incomplete installation. And this last one here is kind of interesting. This is somebody who decided instead of installing a four drive, we wanted to install the uh, so they got this really expensive Fuji foam holder. And they got to follow it. They did a really good job. They used the right kind of nails here. They pulled up all the edges and everything. But that's daylight coming here. That's a deal. So it's only got a window in your room. So when you're waiting for all this effort and cost to do this, it's very terrible. But they didn't really understand what they were doing. So that's kind of what we call the conditional line uh, layer of installation. And you can see that quite a bit in people's houses. Where like in one in one part of the attic it might be on the floor and then in another part of the attic it might be at the slopes but the, the two are connected so it doesn't make much sense. This was an interesting house I was in in Nashua. Um, I was kind of like mesmerized by all the really cool lights and stuff they had, but I was more interested in you know what's going on in the attic. And there is an attic back in here. They had really really massive ice dams over at least part of the house. Um, there's windows up there that go to the outdoors, so obviously there's some kind of attic up there. What you want to notice here is that there's a heating vent right here in the middle, a couple of feet down from the windows. Um, yeah, so I kind of made a mental note of that, and then I went up through the attic hatch and looked at the back of that wall from the other side, and this is what it looked like. But here's that, here's that duct that it covers, it goes through the wall here into the living room, right there. And what do you notice about the area above that? There's no insulation at all. Yeah. So the windows are, you can't see the windows because they're above that, above the roof, right? So there's a whole strip here. It's feet high by like 30 feet long. There's no insulation. This is like a, a brand new renovation that they just had done. So again, an, an oversight probably on someone's part. They just didn't realize that that part of the wall is actually facing the, the room, not the outdoors. <clears throat> So even you know in brand new renovations or in in new houses you see stuff like that. Yeah, that was a huge part of it. Yeah, I mean the other part was that they had all the stuff up there. They had the furnace up there, which is generally speaking not a good thing to do. I'm sure to have furnace up in your attic. So they had some other issues going on too, and there was some air leakage going on, which we'll talk about in a minute. But that was a huge part of it. Okay, so here's a little bit of heat rises. I understand why you say that, though. It's a little bit of a trick question, right? So I know it's, there are situations in life where it looks like heat rises, but actually, we already talked about where heat goes. Remember where heat goes? In the first one? Cold. Oh, no, it's so it's cold. It doesn't matter if it's hot or bad, it's not the white or south or north, right? It's going to go to cold. But the thing is, hot air will actually rise. So that looks like heat is rising, but it's not really the heat that's rising. It's just the air that happens to more compared to some other air, and it just rises, so that makes it look like heat rises, but it doesn't. Um, again, so if you had two bricks like that, and you put the hot water on top of the cold one, the heat's going to go down into the cold brick. Think of your house like a hot air balloon, right? Hot, hot air balloons would not work. That wouldn't be a thing if warm air did not rise. That's the whole principle of a hot air balloon, is you have a burner down here that takes the cold air, makes it hot, and then it rises and lifts the balloon up. So, I kind of want to think about our house in, in a similar fashion. So since warm air is more buoyant, it is going to rise, it gets to the top of the house, and we all want to stay because it's expensive and it pays you to go, you want to stick around. But it doesn't, it leaks out of your house. There's gas and cracks and holes, and it leaks out. Well, if you think you're face by something, you would run out of air in your house. If you always have cold air getting pulled in down low to replace all the hot air, it's going out of the top. So that's kind of like what we call the stack effect in, uh, in the building science world. Um, it doesn't happen like in September, it wasn't happening in your house. Now it's happening if you're not heating your house. The, the colder it gets, if you're still heating your house, the more this, you're going to notice this. You know, if you kind of took a house and cut it away, these are some of the places that are leaking. And the way to remember this is this is where those ABCs come in, right? Attic, basement, center. So the most important ones are up in the attic. Those are all blue arrows because that's warm air leaving. And then the second priority is the basement. Those are all it's the lowest area in the house. So the pressure difference is going to be the greatest there. So that's where most of the cold air is going to be coming in. And the center of the house, yeah, there's some, but it's really not the priority. You really don't want to spend too much time worrying about the center of the house. I know that sounds kind of counterintuitive because there's nobody living in the basement and no one's living in the attic, but that's where the uh, the building science says that the energy loss is happening. 
Um, how do you know what's leaking? Well, you can put on a dust mask over your attic and you can look around. And if you tab, let's say you have like, um, this is, this is uh, chopped up fiberglass, like blue and fiberglass, it's pink. But when you move it away from a light or a ball top or anything like that, it's not gonna be pink anymore. And it's gonna be really dark and stained depending on how old your house is. If your house is hundred years old, it's gonna be really stained. Because the air that's going up through that little crack or through that light, it has pollen in, in it and dust and things like that. Um, if someone's like a smoker in the house, it's gonna be darker. If, if you have a wood stove, it might be even darker. But even in a house that has really clean air, you're still gonna have all the staining up there, right? Um, you can you could find where the electrician ran all the wires through the top place. That's gonna have all the staining on. And that's not it, that's not just air that got into that one bay next to your light switch. It could be air from your whole entire wall in your bedroom. Because remember most bedrooms have electrical sockets. So the electric you can look through the wall with an invisible camera, like in X-ray vision. There's an electrical wire that goes from socket to socket to socket to socket. So there's a hole in all the two by fours going all the way across. So that means any air getting into that wall can work its way across. And then when it gets to the one bay where the light switch is, where the wire goes up into the attic, then it just goes right up through the attic. Just a little bit of a trickle, but it's 24 7 for six months of the year. Air coming out of this little hole. <laughs> Um, chimney chases are really famous. Like this, this gap around the chimney is so big. Like I, I could drop my phone sometimes and go all the way down. I would do that. Before. It looks like it did that because my phone's all cracked and everything. But if you drop it, sometimes it'll go all the way out of the basement from the attic. So that means the whole house is connected to the outdoors through that one little gap around. We, we'll talk about how to you know, do something about that coming up. So now that you know a little bit more about convection, you know. It's a good idea or not. This is a hatch that somebody made out of pegboard. You know, pegboard is stuff you have in your garage. Like the hand shovels or the posts in here. It's not that. Um, definitely not a good idea because A, it's only this thick. And I said our, our wood has an R value of one for every inch. So it's a quarter inch thick. It's only like R.25. But even if it had 16 inches of site of insulation on top of it, that's enough insulation. But over a period of years, you would pull that down and look and it would just be a whole bunch of dark spots from that insulation because the air is going up from every single one of those little holes into your attic. Another reason to make sure that air from your house doesn't get in your attic is because even though the air in your house might now feel really humid in the wintertime, if it goes into your attic, it's going to get humid because of the way the physics works. So the air escapes into the attic, it cools off, goes in humidity, goes up, and then all of a sudden you get situations like this. Technically, I can't tell this person they have a mold problem because I'm not like a mold expert. Uh, a lot of times when I go in acts like that, instead of being all black, it's all white. And I touch you and it's frost. I'm like, okay, I feel qualified to say that you have frost in your attic. Like you don't need the license, license to know what frost is. Um, and frost is from water, and that's going to cause a mold problem. Right? So very important um, for that too. This is not like a roof leak or anything like that. It's all interior air getting up into an attic. Going from the attic down to the basement, uh, you know, hopefully you have a door going out to your bulkhead. There are some houses that don't even have any doors at all. But hopefully you have a door. If you have a door, you shouldn't see light come around it. It should be really weather stripped as well. Um, this area called the ring choice in, in most people's basements is an area where a lot of air filters in because you know, no two by four and two by 10 is exactly consistent measurements. And over time, it, it twists and it turns and it shrinks, the foundation settles. Um, so a lot of people just stuff some fiberglass up there, but we'll talk about fiberglass and why that is probably not a very good idea because it's not really stopping airflow and it's also not covering the whole thing there too. So there's other ways of doing that. And the center of the house is not your priority, but there are some things you can do if you have like a flue pipe or maybe a, a damper for your fireplace, you know, make sure that that seals up well. Um, you know, we'll, we have a slide coming up on windows um, most people think that they're leaking a lot, but they really aren't. Um, at some point, usually someone says, like, oh, well, it's going to have breathe, depending on how long you've been around. I just heard that phrase, you know, that was a kind of a mantra of a lot of builders for many, many years because they thought that. It's not true. Houses don't need to breathe. People need to breathe. <laughs> and people need to have fresh air. That's a whole different thing. Um, but the, the fact of the matter is, in almost everyone's house in New Hampshire, there's way more air infiltration going on than you want or you need. And you can tighten up your house for energy efficiency considerably and you still don't have to worry about 
getting it so tight that you don't have like you're putting it in your um, the only way to know for sure is to do a blower door test. We'll talk about that a little bit coming up. Um, these days, the only way of knowing is kind of just relying on air coming into your walls willy nilly, uncontrolled through gaps and cracks that you happen to leave there by accident. The better way of doing it is to actually introduce nice, fresh outdoor air into your house and then take some of that sale mass in your house and get rid of it and put it outside. Well, you wouldn't want to just take that excess of air and dump it outside, and you wouldn't want to take that 20 degree air and like, dump it onto your bed. So there's a this is called an HRV. It's got the heat exchanger on the inside, and it sort of pass it crosses the paths of the streams of the different pieces of uh, air and extracts some of the energy. So those are you know more and more becoming standard in most houses. The other way you can do it is with just a, a bath fan like this. This is a, a standard uh, bath fan that's rated for continuous use. Um, so most of the time it wouldn't be on continuous use, but you might have it on a timer so that it, it runs like 10 minutes an hour or one hour a day. Uh, and it would sort of get rid of some of that stale air. Whether someone's in the bathroom or not, it would just come on. So that's another way of sort of ensuring that you have this, uh, you know, indoor air quality that you need in a really, really, uh, a home that's very tight. Most people's bath fans, a lot of times people say they're going outside and they're going out and they're not, they're just like laying there like this. Going toward the outside, it's not actually laying there. Um, a lot of times they're done with this flimsy plastic stuff, which I think they should just outlaw. I don't even know why that exists. Just a huge chunk of ice that was in one that I found. Um, detached. Yeah, so your bath fans should go all the way to the outside. Again, it's important to take a step back sometimes and think, okay, if I start attacking out my house, I'm going to start thinking about like, what are the things that could be causing. Like, do I have a crawl space like this that's all dirt? Um, am, I, am I storing like you know my snow blower and paint and stuff in my basement? Um, are my bath fans going all the way to the outside? That kind of thing. Um, you know, there's a lot of things in your house that can that we're not gonna tell you like to get rid of your plants, tell your kids to move out, give your pets to the neighbor, stop cooking. <laughs> like we all have do things in our life in our house that could potentially you know affect the air quality in your house. Um, well, you just have to keep an eye on those things and, and be aware of them. Hopefully this isn't someone's house in the room, right? Because I actually did a presentation here three or four years ago, and I had another picture of it, and the lady guy's like, oh my God, that's my house. <laughs> and I picked her house in the presentation. <laughs> kind of embarrassing. Um, I think this was actually taken in Vermont. But so what's going on here? There's, there's a huge ice dam problem because the snow's melting off the roof. So why do you think the snow's melting off the roof now that we We'll talk a little bit about it. Could be poor insulation, right? Uh, what if I told you it's got R70 up in the attic? Tons of insulation, but it still looks like this. And then what would it be? What was that? It could be not installed properly. Yes, good one. I wasn't thinking of that. But what else could happen even if you have 17 inches of insulation and it is installed properly? What else could, how else could heat be getting up in that attic? Thinking back to some of the slides I showed you where the air is getting out. Because remember, the 17 inches of insulation doesn't stop the air from going out. Close that all the way. So there could be a lot of air from that house going up through like a chimney chase or through the lights or through the wall tops and things. And no matter how much insulation you have, that's still going to be happening. Right? So it's kind of, in most cases, it's a combination of things. Both things could be happening. But these ice dams are really, really dangerous, obviously. You know, if that falls on you, that's your last day on this planet, probably. Um, I looked at a building across town a couple of years ago where the ice dam came off three stories up and crushed somebody's car. Two years in a row, crushed their car. And it wasn't even their apartment. He lived on the other side of the building because, you know, they had numbered spaces. Um, so, yeah, it can be really damaging. It can also damage your house, right? So as, it, it, as the snow starts to melt and run down the roof, it hits that dam. It's called an ice dam because it stops the water. It can actually start to back up onto the shingles. And if you haven't done like a, a full ice and water seal underneath the, the asphalt shingles, it can start to like come into your house. You know, I've been in homes where they have buckets on the ground to catch all the water coming in. So that's a sign that there is a really serious heat loss problem in that house. Um, insulating and air sealing is not necessarily guaranteed to solve this problem, make it go away. Um, there are some other things that affect ice dams that we can't do much about, like sunlight and things like that. But the things that we can control are the heat loss in the house. 
Uh, hopefully you know enough to know to, uh, this is not a safe and easy way to get rid of ice dams. And you can laugh at this as much as I do when I go by this the hardware store to see this. I mean, technically speaking, I suppose it's not false advertising because if you did get up there and do that, I mean, it's hard. It's a 50 pound bag. You gotta put your boots on, you put your ladder up, go up the ladder, sprinkle that on the edge of your roof. Like, that's not very safe, not very easy. Um, but technically speaking, yeah, it probably will get rid of ice up there. But what happens in two weeks when we get a nice, another big snowstorm? You got another ice dam. Because this is a one-shot deal. It doesn't keep every ice dam from happening from here for eternity. So this is like an emergency situation. Like, I gotta get rid of the ice dam on my roof. But if, you, if you're using this stuff on your roof, you really ought to start thinking about like, well, where, why is it happening? You know, like instead of just putting a Band-Aid on it, think about what's going on with this house that makes it so that this is something that they can sell. Okay, going back to those ABCs, what do you do? So remember those ABCs, you wanna get up in your attic, you wanna insulate, get as much insulation up there as you can. But before, before you do that, you wanna get in there and air seal and, and figure out where all the air is going up, right? Because it's really hard to go in afterwards. You can see this gentleman here, he's putting in like 15, 16 inches of cellulose, going through and finding all those places where the air's coming out afterwards, even if you're a professional, it's really hard to do. So it's important to think about that air sealing first and then think about adding the insulation. Going back to the air sealing, like here's an example of sealing that around that shading, right? Um, this is actually done by a professional with like a coil saw and metal and sheet metal. And we've done fire clock air stuff. So we can take it to a little bit of different components of square shading. It's really not actually able to do that. Um, this is basically the case where the homeowner had put in insulation, was covered, it was like completely pressed with mice and everything. So we got it all removed, but basically had it. And we had so many holes. Going out of their living space, they decided, you know what, let's just have a company come in and just you know, take a sheet of spray foam like this. But just an inch, it's really expensive. So, we want to keep spraying to get the R50. That would be really expensive. So, the plan here now the spray foam is in, then the cellulose will come in. The blow of cellulose, you can see there's a wooden dam there around the uh, around that chimney. So, they're going to have to fill it up so it so almost gets to the top of that right there. That way it's not touching the chimney. That's kind of like what we call a hybrid approach. So it's a little bit of both. You know, usually when I'm in the house and I pull down a drop down stair, I can look right up into the attic. Sometimes you'll see one of those cheap little tent things that you can buy at the hardware store. They're actually pretty useless. They don't do anything. There's no R value to them and they really don't stop any air. So they're not really doing much. Um, so this is what, what was put in here is a piece of wood with six inches of this stuff on the back of it. So it's fully insulated. And you can see there's really good white weather stripping around there. It's more important that that is weather stripped really well in the front door, because that's where most of the hot air is going to escape into the attic. Um, this is an attic on the top left where somebody had the real need to store stuff up there. Um, they didn't have any place to put all the stuff in the attic. So uh, the contractor like build a wooden wall and then behind that wooden wall is fully insulated. And on this side of the wooden wall, not quite as insulated, but they need to have some storage. So, you know, each, each attic is a little bit different. Um, bottom left would be like a new wall space and say a cape where they use spray foam to do that exterior wall. These are just some, you know, pictures of what it could look like. If you're really, really handy, you could probably pull some of this stuff off. Most of these pictures are actually done by professionals. Um, yeah, new wall, uh, cape style homes are notorious for being really, really um, problematic. Even brand new cape style homes, I find still have issues. They're just really hard to do right. So in this, in both of these cases, the decision was made to insulate the slopes. Um, sometimes there's a way to do the wall, the knee wall and the floor, but it's a little more complicated usually. So oftentimes the slope is the better way of going with that. Yeah, going from the A down to the B, the basement, like this is a before and after picture. This is a, a, a typical, um, Okay, so we're doing, you see the light coming through, right? Because that whole case is designed to keep robbers out and that case is in the bar. That's the light. It's not designed to keep air out, it's not airtight. So the really should be going there. You can fill out all those spaces once they put the water in the back and make the cut. So this is a nice, um, you know, it's not a commercially made door. It's not very pretty or anything, but it works really well. It's fully insulated, it's fully weather stripped, and that's going to keep a lot of that cold air from getting pulled into that basement. I want to have a good thermal barrier on all six sides of your house, the four walls, the top, and the bottom. 
But when we say bottom, we usually almost never literally mean uh, the bottom of your house or the ceiling of your base. Because in most cases, that's a really bad idea because you have pipes hanging down, you have ducts, you might have a washer and dryer, you got your furnace, you got your boiler, you got your water conditioner, things like that. But you don't want that stuff on the cold side of the insulation. So the better way of getting your thermal barrier on the bottom of your house usually is to do the walls. Um, top left picture is a nice smooth concrete wall. So that could get done with rigid foam board. Um, notice it's not like the sort of stereotypical like pink board or blue board that you might see at the hardware store because that really should not be used in that fashion and left like that for fire code reasons. But this stuff can be because it's got this foil face on it. Um, bottom right picture there is, you know, an old rubble foundation with old rocks and stones and things. Obviously, that can't go on there. So that would have to be done with spray foam. Tricky. Um, you can you can mess them up pretty easily. So this is where you sort of might want to start thinking about, you know, getting a professional to do this. Um, you, you can go to the hardware store and you can actually buy spray like this. You can buy it in little like little, little propane tanks, you know, but it's way more expensive to do it that way than to actually hire a company to do it because it's coming off of a truck if they do it. Um, you have to wear a respirator. I mean, it's 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 pretty hard work and it's um, pretty hard to do right. If you have issues with water in your basement, really important that you get those fixed first. That might be putting gutters on your house. It might be drainage outside. It might be putting in a sump pump, a dehumidifier, all sorts of different things. But um, you have to be careful as you start to seal up a house. If you have a, like a really bad water problem, and in Portsmouth, a lot of us have water problems, I know, uh, because it's your house is probably built on ledge or on clay and things like that. So basements can be really tough to deal with around here. And center of the house, not much you can do there. There's some weather stripping. You can do some stuff in your in your flues. Um, if you have a chimney like this in your closet, you can do some stuff in there. But you shouldn't be doing even thinking about the center of the house until you've already done the attic in the basement. Going down to the center of the walls. If you have empty walls in your house, you can get them insulated. Typically, that gets done with just same kind of thing. But instead of being like loosely blown like you saw that guy doing in the attic, it's actually dense packed in there with a special machine. It's not the same machine that they give you for free at one of the big box stores. If you buy a bunch of sailors, they're like, here, we'll give you a machine. You take it home, you can put it in for free. That's all fine and dandy for an attic, but that will not do it. This fellow here is going to try. Um, they won't be happy because we'll probably burn the machine out and it's not going to work. Um, it takes a lot of work. You got to take siding off. Um, you got to drill holes. Sometimes there's cross members that are in the way, so you might have to take off more siding than just one strip. Um, so this is definitely something where if this is something that you want to get done. Um, you know, professional installation is recommended on that one. Uh, we usually don't even try to insulate walls if there's already something in there, even just a little bit, because you have to get that hose like all the way up into the cavity and down and everything. It's really hard to do a good job unless it's a completely empty cavity. If you have a four side air system, you probably have ducts running in your knee walls or running in your attic. If you have that, you're, they're probably not sealed. Uh, these days, they're supposed to all be sealed. In fact, they're supposed to be tested too. Um, but in the old days, no one worried about that. So you probably have a bunch of air leaking out of that system. Um, it sounds strange, but you don't want to use duct tape for that. I don't know why they call duct tape duct tape because it works terribly on ducts. It just falls off, it dries out, and it just leaves a mess. So you want to get mastic. Mastic is the best way to do it. It's like this goopy stuff. You can use a, a tool or you can just get your hand and put it in there with a glove and you just rub it on and you fill up all the little cracks. There's no window salesman in the audience, are there? All right, good. I don't know what I'm saying anyway, but I don't know what kind of math window salesmen use, but it's not any kind of math that makes sense from a building science point of view. The utility rebate program doesn't cover windows. Why? Because they're almost never a really cost-effective measure, right? So to, to replace like one single window in your house, you could replace it with the top of the line, best window in the world. It's gonna cost you like a thousand dollars or more. It's still gonna be the worst part of your house. Even the best window in the world. They don't measure windows with our value. But if they did, even the best one is only like R5, R6. So to spend all that money just to improve a little bit of a part of your house, a little bit, and it's still only a little bit better than what you had before, it doesn't make any sense at all. Now, if you're if the seal is shot, it's all fogged up, and you can't see out of it, or it's cracked and it won't shut and everything like that's a good reason to replace the window. But it's really not going to uh, give you a good return on investment to replace them. Um, there's other things you can do. 
Um, well, the first thing you can do, as I said, is go up in your attic and do some air filling. If you have a leaky window, attic work will help that leaky window. So it works by magic. It makes the window leak less because the, the air doesn't want to come in because the air is not going out up top. But you can also get some of these really good cellular shades. They have them with tracks. They have remote controls now. They have like wireless remote controls. You could be in your office and you can open and shut your curtains or on your skylights and things. Um, there's a lot of good companies out there that make really good interior storm windows, which are really popular here in Portsmouth because a lot of people have historic homes. You might be in a historic district where you're limited on what you can do. Um, so an interior storm would fit into your window and that'll, you could have it take an old single pane and you can kind of make it a double pane. That's a fraction of the cost of replacing the whole thing. So this is probably how you're feeling in your head at this point, because like I said, there's a lot of material. We talk a lot about a lot of different things. At this point, you know, you might be thinking about your own house. And, oh, man, there's a lot of stuff going on there. It might be time to think about getting some professional help rather than just sort of like piecemealing it and doing it yourself. I'm, I'm really a big proponent of like do-it-yourself stuff. I think it's great. But sometimes you have to just like kind of make a decision that it's better off just to get somebody else to, to look at it and make sure you're doing it right or to do it themselves. You know, do it. So an energy audit is a great idea. An energy audit is going to be a complete assessment of your house, not just your one attic or your one basement. It's going to be everything. We never just go into one spot. We're going to be crawling into every little nook and cranny of your house. Um, we're going to be doing combustion safety tests like this onto your heating equipment, which is really important. Um, at the end of the time, you're going to get a fully a, a written report that's going to detail all the deficiencies in your house. It'll detail like what could be done about it. Here's the different options. Here's how much, in some cases, here, here's how much it'll save you. Here's how much it's going to cost, you know, depending on how thorough the audit is. But really good thing to do. Um, like I said, in New Hampshire, anybody can kind of think about being an installer or an installation expert or installer. Um, so you want to get somebody who's got some experience, got some qualifications, some certifications. Um, BPI is one of the biggest ones in the country. There's a national organization that trains energy auditors, so you could look for that. Um, you'd want to make sure that that person knew about blow doors and infrared and things like that. Um, if you're looking for a place to go to find out some of these people, who these people are, you could go to this organization called BIPA. It's the Residential Energy Performance Association. Um, I'm actually the secretary of that organization. And it's comprised of people who are all um, you know, certified by either ResNet or BPI, things like that. You can also contact me too. And they will um, help guide you towards some of their contractors that they use, because they only use um, reputable contractors that have these types of certifications. If you get an energy audit, um, as long as you don't have uh, the mission plan, you know, this is a great flexible material for you to use back in the back in the day. They don't have a step plan, that's why I have a back yard. A lot of people have this room, you know, in your attic or in your walls. Um, because of my house is asbestos, you can't do a lot of work. Um, you also need to be able to accept the pipe routes on an old steam system or even a current steam system. Um, because it, it doesn't sound like it kicks up lots of dust or anything, but it could kick up a little filament of this stuff, and that's not good. So as long as you don't have that stuff, we can do a blower door test, which is a really neat thing. Um, technically speaking, every new house in New Hampshire is supposed to be getting one of these tests done before they get a CO. Um, that's not happening. It's, it's happening in Portsmouth, I think. Um, some other towns are doing it, but there are a lot of towns that are not enforcing that. Um, so it's a big fan that goes in the doorway like that. It sucks out all the air, and you basically identify where the air is coming in, where it's going, uh, where the leaks are, you can find out how bad the problem is. I mean, in most cases, you already know the house is leaky. Like the homeowner has already said it's leaky. You looked at the bills; the bills say it's a leaky house. Um, but it's good to kind of quantify that and know, like, how much is that? How much is all that leaking costing the homeowner? Um, you can also use it to figure out, like, is this house getting to the point where they need to start worrying about uh, being so. Um, energy efficient and tight that they need to worry about indoor air quality problems. So that's a thing you can do with the blower door too. Um, you also use them before and after when you're doing a project to, think, to see how much um, you've actually accomplished. Really neat tool. I love doing these uh, when I go do audits. The other thing that might get used is an infrared camera. Now, people think infrared cameras are really, really cool. They see through walls and stuff. No, they don't. They don't see through walls. All they do is tell you the temperature of whatever it is you're looking at. It's really kind of simple. So like in this picture here on the top right, they had this, you know, this HOME home sign on their wall. 
But when I looked at that with the infrared camera, it's a whole bunch of different colors. And that means it's a whole bunch of different temperatures. And it shouldn't be, it should all kind of be the same temperature. So there's something going on with that wall. Um, you know, I wouldn't have known that without using the infrared camera. Um, this is actually an interesting thing down here. You can see this, your purple is, generally speaking, is like cooler areas. That's cold. You don't want to see a lot of that in the house. So when, when I was looking at that little triangle area, it's showing up like really, really cold. Sure enough, there's a bathroom below there. Uh, sure enough, they've had frozen pipes two years in a row in that bathroom because of that. I'm like, well, yeah, I can see why. That, that, that space is freezing cold, you know? This house was uh, also built by an architect, which is interesting. Um, nothing against architects. I think there's some really good architects out there. Hopefully I didn't offend anyone, but there are also some architects that are sort of more focused on aesthetics and things like that. And maybe they were sleeping through the class about making sure your house is insulated and making sure it's you know sealed up well. I mentioned combustion safety, right? Everything that burns makes carbon monoxide. If you don't know about carbon monoxide, you should, because it can kill you and it can make you really sick. Um, I don't have time right now, but if I if I pull if I got my phone out and I went to Google News and I just typed in like carbon monoxide deaths, I guarantee you there will be at least a few articles just in the last day or two of people somewhere in the country that died from carbon monoxide. And California could be California to do so. Because the water heater backed up in the house, or because somebody, a bird made a nest in the food pipe outside. All sorts of things that can happen. Um, and it's really sad. And then if, if I do a button up next week, I could open up Google News again and look for new art, two new articles about carbon monoxide that next week. Um, it's happening all the time. So the way to make sure you're, that doesn't happen is first of all, make sure you have a CO detector in your house. Uh, I would suggest one on every floor that has a combustion device. So if you have like a boiler or furnace in your basement, you should be one down there. You got a wood stove, you should have one on that floor too. Um, so the testing is going to get done on this equipment. If you get an audit, you know, both before and after you get work done. A lot of people think that just because the boiler or the furnace works, they could just leave it alone. Like I've been in homes where like literally no one has touched the furnace in 20 years. Right? That's not the way you want to operate in your house. It should get serviced every year. It doesn't matter if it's propane or gas, whatever. It should always get serviced every year, tuned up and checked over each year. This is an interesting house that I was actually, this is actually in Portsmouth. So I, I fired up the blower and we're good. The blower works fine over there in the house. So if you're suction, it goes in and out through the fan, all the windows are shut. You fire your blower, you're going to be bad. It's serious. And of course, what was that? I said, what's my answer? Uh, I'm not that. Okay, well, I'm going to the door. It's not the It's not terrible. So, the last thing is, we're going to have all the doors still open. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. the same. It's not 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 the same. It's she would have been staying there every night, brushing her teeth. She never would have known that all her hair is going around that mirror, out of that house. Even if she put her hand up here and moved against the wall and she brushed her teeth, she still wouldn't have felt it because the warm air of the is going around the mirror, you can't really feel that. But the motor reverses the flow of air so much so that it actually like, pulled that thing right off the wall. That stuff usually doesn't happen, but it was kind of an interesting thing. You know, of course, and that's when she says, well, yeah, this was a flipped house. It was built in the 50s. And I'm like, in my, in my mind, I'm like, I can see the medicine cabinet right now. It's from 1952. And the flipper was like, oh, I'll just chuck that in the dumpster. And then what should we do? Uh, I'll just go, go get a beer and we'll put a beer over it. It'll be fine. Uh, this, believe it or not, is one of the worst houses I've ever been in. Um, that's like what it was talking in the background. This side of it was like a half mile long, hairpin turns going up the side of this mountain. Uh, I thought I was at the wrong house because they were in the rebate program, which is only supposed to be for like energy inefficient houses. I'm like, are you sure? The guy said, yeah, come on in. Um, so it just goes to show you, you, you never know, you know, no matter how much money you spend and how big your house is and how cool looking it is, um, there can be massive, massive ice dam problems and massive, massive you know, heat loss problems. So we'll move on to the New Hampshire Sage um, stuff at the end here. Um, as I said, I mentioned a few of these already. There's a whole slew of rebates, right? There's rebates for, like I said, appliances. You can get them for lights. You can get them for, um, there's a, if you may have heard the term net zero, net zero homes are really cool. They are homes that actually produce as much power as energy consumed. 
So if you come across all the things on your work from your house, it's interesting that it's easy to get enough. You can go ahead and pop in there and you won't have any copays in them. Go back to the bill. Well, what is the arrangement? That's a pretty big change. So that's a net zero home. There's there's even things for that. Um, all sorts of different um, different programs. Um, Want to mention, you know, upgrades and heating, cooling equipment. There's some really good rebates out there for people who are. Um, you know, oftentimes, this doesn't really matter to you unless your boiler, your furnace is like really really old or it's about to die or it has died. That's when these some of these things really really um, can come into play. Um, there's also, I got a slide in here that I have in the, uh, the IRA Act that Congress just passed has a whole bunch of different rebates for these things too, in addition to the New Hampshire state's rebates. So you can really go far with some of these. Um, but it is important to remember that like, you just like putting water into a leaky bucket, bucket is kind of foolish. Spending a whole bunch of money, you could get a really good rebate to get a new boiler or a new furnace. It makes a whole lot of sense if you haven't done the air sealing in your house. Then you can think about um, you know upgrading your heating systems or cooling systems. Um, heat pumps are gonna be um, you know, by the time my kids are buying a house, I think like the idea of a, a boiler or a furnace in the basement, that's gonna be kind of like almost like a dinosaur, right? This is the way of the future. Um, mini splits like this or or um, cold climate heat pumps, you can call a couple different things. Um, they've come a long way in the last couple of years. They work in our climate. Um, they work way up in northern Maine. They work really well. Um, I'm not going to get into specifics because we're running short on time, but um, there are some really good rebates for those too. Um, there's a bunch of other benefits too. We can talk more at the end. Yeah, these are just some examples of some of the different rebates that, that are out there for you know, doing some kind of switch of fuels or upgrading um, your heating, your cooling equipment. Um, there's even a thing for new homes, right? There's a there's a uh, a rebate that can that can come your way if you're building a new home and you want to get it certified as a home performance energy star new home. But what we're really here what we're really here to talk about is the home is the program for existing homes and how to get those um, improved through this program. So if you go to their website, um, you can go. I'll show you the slides in a minute. What it looks like, but basically you end up getting an energy audit for only a hundred bucks. Which is a really good deal because usually they're three, four, five hundred dollars for most companies to come to a full energy audit. So you get your audit's only a hundred bucks, um, which is a discount. And then depending on what your auditor sees when they're there, um, they'll pay for 75% of all those improvements, all the way up to six thousand um, dollars. It's not a guarantee that the stuff's all going to get paid for. Um, the auditor has to put it into the software model, the software has to sort of calculate how much is it going to cost, how much is it going to save. Um, and that's all based on like what you use for fuel and how much fuel you use and everything. Um, so the, the computer will actually do what's called a, a benefit cost ratio analysis and it'll figure out like basically is this thing saving enough so that Eversource or whoever your utility is can have to pay for it. If you're using propane or oil, it's probably not even an issue. It's gonna it's gonna pass through what no matter what usually. Um, so basically you go to their their website, which I'll, I'm not going to talk about their website. I think my kids could probably go to their website. They're almost as good as their resources, but Frank knows my feelings about their website. <laughs> um, it's a little clunky. It takes you a while to get there, but eventually you get to this page where you can test your home. Um, you got to click through a couple things to get there. Um, that's just the nature of the beast, right? So you get there and you test your home. You have to know a couple things. You have to know your, your utility up on the top left. You have to know your zip code. You got to know your condition square footage. I'm not sure how Portsmouth works, but um, if you look at your property tax card, make sure that they're talking about heated square footage, not living space. Because some people's homes might be 3,500 square feet of living space, but 800 of that might not be heated. It might be like a sun porch on the back of the, room of the house that doesn't have any heating. And the town will still call that living space. But for, the, for our purposes, we're only looking at actual heated space. So be careful with that. Um, so you type in your, your heated or your conditioned square footage, and then you got to put in how much you use for fuel. So this person here is 800 gallons of oil and two quarters of oil. If you, have, you can only put in two. If you have three or four, that's okay. You can call their source, and they will just, like let's say you were using pellets also, um, they can translate the pellets into like what that would be if it was wood, and they just put do it that way. 
Um, so you put all that in there, and then you hit go, and you keep your fingers crossed, and you hope that you're up there in the red. Well, because if you're in the red, it's kind of it's a kind of a mixed blessing, right? That means like, yeah, you're spending a whole lot of money on on your energy, which you probably already know. If you're down here in the green, you'll get like a little note that says, "Hey, congratulations, you have pretty good." But you start getting up there in the red, that's when you start getting involved in you know qualifying for this program. Um, these days, I believe these numbers are correct. They've changed a little bit in the last couple of years for various different reasons. But if you're ever source of COA, you got to score at least a nine. I mean, I have people that like they're up here at 16, like they're, they're like, mm -hmm. it, it, like Texas and all at the very top. Uh, Liberty and gas have a different sort of uh, set of rules, so you have to be a 10 to get into that program. Yeah. And I believe Liberty Gas actually might be a 12. Might, you have to get a really high number for that. Um, so, in a way, you kind of want yourself, you know, if you put your numbers in, like you're hoping that you get at least a nine, because then you're going to get into this program. Um, if you get into the program, you'll get a big long report. One of the pages will look like this, and it'll tell you real quickly, like, what each thing is. Like, Improving a thousand square feet of the attic floor, improving your air leakage of the house, improving the wind joist insulation, putting insulation on the walls, the base. Uh, down here is the total. So this project is actually like over ten thousand dollars project. But luckily, Eversource here are the utilities that keep getting six thousand dollars now, which only means four thousand dollars for the home. Um, obviously, that would change. Like, let's say the homeowner is like, "Well, like, yeah, I can't, I can't even afford the floor." Well, then we can we can make like, maybe remove this one here, like drop that one. So the numbers can change. You can tweak the project a little bit. It still has to be resubmitted and has to get approved and everything. But at the end of the day, pretty awesome to have somebody else, you know, contributing towards this project. And usually, at some point, somebody says, "Why the heck does EverSource care how much oil?" Everybody says, Sure, answer is that um, I don't have a case that shows this, but if you on the next page of the report, it would say, okay, if you do this project, it'll save you whatever, you know, three hundred dollars a year or nine hundred dollars a year. You'll also have a problem in there that says like how many pounds of CO2 will not get introduced to the gas here if you do this project because all that oil will not get burned. So that's not where our air source comes in. Like that's what they're interested in. To be honest with you, they're not really doing it to be nice to like help you out. Well, um, they're doing it because they need to see that energy savings there. So it doesn't matter to them whether energy savings for the most part is you know oil or propane or what. It's just it all going to come down to BTUs when you tra translate it back and, and, and CO2. That's kind of an oversimplification, but that's the best I could do right now. Uh -oh. There is an income program. This is what we've got. So there is a program for folks who are on limited income. Um, I don't know a whole lot about this one. Uh, I do know in some cases it's actually better because they'll pay 100% of the improvements. Sometimes they'll pay for some stuff, stuff some stuff that leads to many other programs. Um, but that again is all based on uh, you know income and everything like that. Two on one is the number you want to remember for that. You can um, get information about that. Um, I put a couple of slides in here. Um, this is off of Gene Shaheen's website. I'm, I'm not uh, endorsing her or anything like that. I'm not being political. I just, I've been trying to get information about the IRA because people have been asking me and I want to know what's in it. What does it mean for homeowners? And it's really hard to find information. Somebody just yesterday told me, oh, go to Gene Shaheen's website. So I went there. There is some stuff on there. So I just kind of grabbed it. Um, I just want to be you know, clear on where I got it. Um, so there's some really interesting things here where they're really pushing people to get into you know, what's called like uh, positive electrification. They're trying to get more and more things to buy electricity um, for various different reasons. But there's some really neat things for uh, heat pump water heaters, uh, even stoves, dryers, insulation, air sealing, all sorts of different things. Um, if you go to her website, you can actually click there and it can tell you all different things. Um, there's some other things there too. There's this. Um, Residential clean energy credit. Um, you know, there's always been a little bit of credit you can do on your income taxes. I think a lot of tax experts that if you get insulation put in your house, I think you need to be able to like, some kind of have some kind of credit for just the cost of the insulation. You could do the labor and what it costs to put it in, you could just do the material. But now I think you can actually, somewhere in here, I saw that it says you can actually do the labor. Um, 
Um, I don't know where it is. Somewhere I saw something you can actually do later. Anyway, it's, it's a new thing that's coming out. It doesn't start until 2023, but um, some of these uh, potential rebates are really, really big. Um, and I think it's really going to change a lot of things for a lot of folks. And this is in addition to the New Hampshire State's rebates. So it's not like you get one or the other kind of thing. Um, so we'll find out more about that, you know, as things come out. So I think we covered all this stuff. We'll get some real basic stuff. In the beginning, we talked about the ABCs. We talked about air sealing first. Um, Hopefully, everyone remembers what those ABCs are. We talked about adding insulation. We talked about you know how to get help from home performance professionals. You know, getting an energy audit done. And then finally, we kind of talked about well, you know, how does how can the utility help here with rebates and things like that. Um, let's see. That's my email. If anybody wants to have any questions that comes up later, any questions that come up later, email me. Feel free to do that. I'll be around for a while to answer any questions too. 